Hello there. Um, Hello. Welcome. Uh, um, welcome to uh, Answer a Broadsheet Reader. Uh, we're joined by Michael McNamara. Uh, he's an independent uh, TD from Clare. He was a former Labour TD and he more recently chaired the uh, Oireachtas Committee, uh, the Special COVID-19 Response Committee, uh, we're looking at the we're looking at the government's response to the um, to the pandemic at the beginning, uh, and it published its report last week, I think. Uh, I think on the eighth uh, of uh, yeah, on the eighth of October. Okay, and uh, uh, ironically, today we've heard about <coughs> a nursing home in Galway, um, Michael. One of the recommendations from the report was the uh, a regulatory framework. For people in nursing homes, for the um, anyway, we, we can get we can get to that. But uh, Michael joins us from the convention centre where the Doyle is sitting today, and uh, he's going to answer questions that broadsheet readers have raised over the last week or so. So um, as things have sort of developed, maybe over the last even the last twenty four hours or so, uh, we will we'll, uh, be cognizant of that. Um, I'm just going to share the the questions with you. Uh, Michael, um, and we're going to go straight into it because we've got about about thirty minutes. Okay, Michael. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, first question: How many times per week does he get confused for Steve Bruce? <laughs> Usually only online. Okay. Can I just? I, I actually did something earlier. Okay. This is how you may look. In <laughs> 20 years. Oh, that's frightening. Uh, the Steve that's Bruce. Frightening. And, um, uh, this is frightening. Committee. There you go. Okay. Uh, something to look forward to. Something to look forward to, indeed. Uh, Kate, favourite sport? Probably hurling, although I was very bad at it. Okay. Uh, Claire uh, Scarif, is that where you're from? Scarif, yeah. I, uh, I, my career was cut tragically short when I got appendicitis when I was full back in the under 12 team and I never really recovered from that. Yeah, and um, Scarif is a hurling stronghold, is it? It is actually. They won um, a county intermediate final um, actually the day before pubs were allowed to reopen. What was that? The, around the 20th of September or so, or whatever date that was. Maybe the 10th of September, that's Sunday. Yeah. Okay, well, um, congratulations then. And uh, Brother Barnabas asks, when the overriding object, oh, no. <laughs> okay, I'm just not going to ask. Uh, Querty123 asks, what's your favorite? Okay, we just, we, uh, <laughs> Miko writes, very hard to think of a question from Michael as he seems to be asking all the right questions anyway. And fair play to you, Michael, for having the, ne the nerve to ask the difficult questions. I suppose the only thing I'd ask him, does he think there is a reason that we haven't increased ICU capacity in our hospitals? It seems incredible that we haven't. Especially since we've had a so. I mean, it was increased, but very marginally. Um, I, I, I really don't know. I mean, we seem to be very slow in responding and developing, increasing our healthcare capacity. Um, I appreciate that it takes six months, I think, uh, the previous president of the, um, uh, of the ICE, uh, Intensive Care Society of, you know, uh, the, the professional or the body of intensive care doctors. I think she said it takes six months to train an ICU nurse, but it's been seven months now since the lockdown. Um, obviously, it's expensive um, as well, but I mean, we're spending billions of money. I mean, we're running the, the biggest deficit in Europe right now. And, you know, okay, money's cheap to borrow uh, right now, but uh, it has to be, uh, well, if it perhaps doesn't have to be paid back, but the state has to at least demonstrate an ability to, to, to uh pay back money before it, it would be lent money. You know, and I, I've first-hand experience of trying to, supporting measures to close the deficit from 11 to, uh, to, to 16, and it's not something that I think should be repeated lightly. Okay, um, Ray asks, hi Michael, do you know if our ICUs are filling up at the same rate as previous years? Um, I, I, I think they are, I mean, uh, uh, the, I mean, I haven't looked at each and every ICU. I mean, I, I'm just reading media reports pretty much the same as everybody else. But I know the Cork one was a capacity, uh, was it last weekend, but that wasn't really due to COVID. I mean, if there were, I think, either one or two COVID patients in it, but the rest of them were, um, like, our, uh, the rest of them were non-COVID patients. Our ICUs are typically uh, operated 100% capacity. Okay, also, do we know how many of our COVID hospitalizations and ICU cases are both PCR positive and displaying COVID symptoms? Is that a bit too... 
Sorry, do we know how many? We, well, we don't know the figures, but I couldn't hear the full question. Are both well, uh, PCR positive and symptomatic, is it? I'm displaying COVID symptoms. I, I, I've, I've no idea. I mean, anybody who tests positive for, um, for, for COVID-19 is determined to be in hospital with uh, COVID-19. And, uh, you know, re regardless of whether they're symptomatic or asymptomatic or even, um, yeah, you, you know, they still have to be separated. So it, it creates a difficulty for, for healthcare management because obviously they have to be separated from, from other patients. Uh, I suppose the difficulty is that PCR testing um, as acknowledged at the COVID committee by um, by Dr. Colm Henry and also on Twitter by um, Dr. Killian de Gascon does also capture people who had COVID uh, up to several weeks previously and are no longer infectious. So, but uh, that's uh, one of the quirks of the PCR testing, as was explained at the committee. Yeah. Um, uh, Andy writes, given what we've seen earlier in the year with the official COVID deaths overestimated as reported by HICWA, um, does Michael have any idea how current COVID hospitalizations numbers compared to previous years for respiratory related hospitalizations? Can I just, um, I will ask Dr. Foley, during the committee, you, you, you um, asked Dr. Cuddy regarding the, the actual, if you had a heart attack, but you had COVID. The, 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 I mean, just that they, we, we were going by whose definition of a COVID death. I mean, I suppose uh, Ronan Glenn afterwards was keen to say that people get, can get a heart attack from COVID because it it, it puts pressure on, on on your heart as well as your respiratory system. But I mean, the question was was sort of broader. If you um um you know are, are injured on in a if you break your leg, for example, and you're 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 brought to hospital and you test you are tested, uh, the majority I. I'm not entirely clear whether all hospitals test, but I've certainly heard of many hospitals who test everybody who's admitted, and it would be a sensible thing to do because you're going to share healthcare facilities with other people. Um, but you know, if you break your leg and you're test positive, you are tested as somebody with COVID. I, I don't know. Um, I did speak. I, I, it's purely anecdotal. I did speak to one um, uh, nurse working at the casualty in Limerick, and she said that she has seen that occur, but it's a, a, a small minority. But I don't know. I simply don't know what n numbers it is. Okay, but just 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 to, just to establish this, that it's only at the inquest then that we'll discover if it was the COVID death. Yes, we, but we, I, I, yes, but I, I'm not entirely clear. Um, if somebody, for example, has uh, indications of trauma, what happens? Uh, I have read online that that they're not counted as COVID. But in any case, if um, if somebody dies and they have been di they have tested positive for COVID in the previous weeks, they are listed as a COVID death un unless and until the coroner determines otherwise. And obviously, it takes a while for the the, the inquest. Okay. But I mean, we fairly regularly. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. No, no, no. It's fine. We 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 we'll, we'll probably revisit that that, that, that uh, topic. Just interested person writes, dear Deputy McNamara. First of all, thank you for taking time to listen to people's direct concerns in this public forum, which is less filtered by my best of interests. <laughs> um, here are my questions. Dr. Martin Feely, a senior doctor in the Midlands Hospital Group, is of the opinion that keeping patients free of COVID from COVID-19 in hospital is a question of staffing, training, and PPE. He said in a recent interview he could guarantee it. Given the extraordinary expense of managing COVID-19 today, why do you think that this option hasn't been explored and costed for the elderly and vulnerable as an alternative? Um. I, I, I don't know, but I mean, there's also, uh, that's a school of thought, uh, Dr. Martin Feely. The, the other school of thought is that it's simply impossible to keep COVID out of nursing homes uh, and to keep it away from the vulnerable. Uh, that, you, you know, but obviously the more testing of, of staff you do, um, uh, I mean, that must be incredibly difficult. I mean, I haven't had to do a, a COVID test, but I understand it's very uncomfortable. It would be, I could imagine, fairly awful to be having be tested regularly because it is actually uncomfortable, I, I understand. Okay. The, um, I'm just come, coming down on his uh, questions a little bit. Uh, the discourse, it's very, very detailed. It might take a parliamentary in writing. We'll send them to you after the, uh, after the show. But... Um, he asked, does, do you agree that with the disease now prevalent in all counties and in large numbers that the county by county travel ban is useless in preventing further, tra further transmission? Well, it's, it's gone now. The whole country's in 
lockdown, I mean, you're allowed to, ex you're, you're required to stay in your home unless you have a good reason to leave, for example, work or uh, uh, going to buy essential goods or exercise within five kilometers. So, well, well, I mean, I think, yeah, but with this five, five, this, it's a 5k thing, pointless and to, to you. I mean, I suppose it's designed to, to limit uh, interactions between people as much as possible, I suppose. And I, it will achieve that to a certain extent. But the difficulty is, I mean, that, that, that can't continue indefinitely. And when do you start trusting people to try and interact more responsibly um, uh, and try to look after themselves? I mean, because you do have to. That's how society is kind of built on trusting people to, 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 to look after themselves. Um, not ours at the moment. I mean, they don't really trust us that much for, with anything at the stage. No, no. I mean, I mean, and I, mean oh, I suppose my, my worry is that, I mean, obviously, you know, the lockdown, it came from China, uh, COVID came from China. And I mean, so China was the first country to respond and it responded with lockdown. Um, but I mean, China is a country, I think, where the population generally isn't, uh, trust. I mean, I haven't been in China very often. Um, as a matter of fact, I think I've only been there once. Uh, but um, you know, it's not a country where people are trusted. Right. But uh, Sorry, just go ahead. Yep. Sorry. No, I mean, we're, we're as a people. I mean, despite the headlines, we're incredibly law-abiding, and we were very compliant. But, uh, I mean, the vast majority, uh, for instance, yep. the vast majority of our readers are. are uh, pro all the measures, probably one more, once even further, level six if you've got it. <laughs> and um, and the, the vast majority of people are wearing masks. I mean, there's a party maybe in, the, in Berlin a club or whatever, and there's an, another, but the vast majority of people are compliant. So why, why the, all the measure, you know, the fines, the talks of fine, why all the heavy heaviness? I, I mean, I, I, I think it's a, I, I don't agree with it as an approach. I mean, I think it's it's a matter of public health. I mean, f first of all, f fines don't work generally. I mean, the fines regime in Ireland doesn't work. I mean, there's millions of euros in unpaid fines in the system. Um, I think there was an enforcement list in Limerick recently. There were 600 people in it, 400 didn't even show up. Bench warrants were issued. Don't know whether the Gardaí have been able to even execute those bench warrants. It's a huge waste of Gardaí resources. But, you know, we're sort of moving from... Uh, accepting that the medical system is going to be overwhelmed so we have to do something about it uh, because we have finite capacity in our medical system <clears throat> to making it the Gardaí's problem but like there's finite capacity in, in Angarda Shikana too and they're by and large doing what they're trained to do which is not to police public health I mean they're you know we're heading into long winter nights that brings a lot of fear particularly for for elderly people in isolated parts of rural Ireland and um, I, I just think it's sort of a, 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 a I don't I don't agree with the approach of, of of trying to police it I don't think you can police health generally uh, regardless of of what area it is and I'm not sure I, but the policing will work in this instance either yeah well we seem to be policing ourselves online anyway I mean everybody's Telling on everybody. Yeah, I mean, most people are, are substantial. I mean, but I mean, the other side of it is you could comply with every single law and still be quite uh, dangerous in terms of the chances of get, getting COVID or passing it on to somebody else. You could break every single restriction and be relatively safe. So, I mean, you know, I'm not advocating that people break restrictions, uh, and I want to make that very clear, uh, but I'm just making the point that it is ultimately about people uh, behaving responsibly themselves, um, uh, you know, washing your hands, uh, ma maintaining a distance, um, and uh, and wearing masks in places where it's not possible to... to, um, to uh, maintain a distance, but I mean, okay. there's a, there's a, yeah. uh, thanks, Michael. There's a number of um, vaccination questions, and I, I really do think it's a different. It's probably a different story. We're talking about like the the, the Rona and um, and the response and what. Liam Deliverance writes: the committee's final report was published last week, and recommendation, recommendations included quicker tracking and tracing, stronger regulatory framework for nursing home residents those in direct provision and people working in new plants. It's extraordinary that your recommendation, everything seems to have repeated itself this week. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, um, uh, look, the fact that the doll has 
scheduled a, a debate of uh, 145 minutes, which is 50 seconds per TD, in which we're going to roll over the power to make further restrictions for a further seven months uh, at a time that we're going back into a, a full lockdown um, without having bothered to consider any of the recommendations in the committee. And like, they're not my recommendations. I was one of uh, 19 TDs uh, from across the Dáil who spent, a, a nice, maybe, I think, four months intensively listening to expert evidence um, I, I think that's a mistake, and it sort of demonstrates a lack of um, of parliamentary accountability or a government not taking Parliament serious if they seriously. Um, but I mean, they're there if they ever do have a change of heart and decide they want to look at uh, uh, at lessons learned, because that's what it was partly about, anyway. Yeah, well, I, I, I saw a lot of the hearings, and there was some incredible, there were some incredible testimonies. I thought uh, I would say this time that I'm. Uh, Professor Hennigan was very good vis-a-vis uh, -vis the... Yeah, I, um, I, I, I thought he was quite good. I thought he was succinct and I thought he made valid points. Um, you know, we, clo we, we determined that bars in Ireland would remain closed because of an outbreak. Uh, we, they asked for the evidence and they were told about media reports about outbreaks in Spain and in Aberdeen. And I've no doubt that there were outbreaks in Spain and Aberdeen, but notwithstanding those, the Spanish authorities kept them open, the UK authorities kept them open, and we closed them. Now, there are undoubtedly bars that pose a risk. I mean, we saw the, the one over the summer, the, the Berlin bar, you know, behaviour that uh, was risky. But like a couple of people sitting in a rural bar, um, which, you know, they're socially distanced anyway in rural bars, typically. Um, I, I just don't see the, the huge risk that that posed. Firstly, secondly, we were told then that it was suddenly safe to, uh, to 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 drink outdoors for a couple of weeks in October, but it wasn't safe for bars to serve outdoors during the summer. Now we're told we should be meeting people outdoors, but all those like sports events outdoors, uh, audiences were our um, spectators were stopped. Um, bars couldn't serve outdoors, restaurants couldn't serve outdoors. I mean, it was uh, it almost seemed like. Um, Restrict, almost a sadistic restrictions, you know. Uh, I mean, maybe there was evidence for some of them, but if there was evidence, uh, and one of the recommendations by the committee was that Neffet publish its evidence, you know, I think people would be more persuaded by what Neffet was saying and, and public health advice if they were seeing the evidence. Because, I mean, um, you, you know, uh, McBride, I think, is the chief medical officer in Northern Ireland. I mean, he's released evidence now which contradicts some of what the um, Neffet were saying here during the past few months. Um, yeah, I mean, how is so this... People, I mean, people obviously do trust uh, people in authority and, and doctors in particular. Um, but, you know, if you're going to have your whole life reorganised for you, you'd like to see some evidence for it. Okay, um, just to lighten the mood, uh, Barry the Hatchet asks, what products do you use on that fine head of hair? <laughs> Actually, um, don't use any products. Um, it just if I, uh, yeah, I don't use hair products. <laughs> it is a, it's a fine, fine head of hair. I'm, 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 Thanks I'm very much. Thanks very much. <laughs> Although I'm, I'm detecting kind of a, a weak texture, perhaps. Uh, we'll, come, we'll come back to that. That's a rumour. Right. You know? <laughs> um, in the Special Committee on COVID-19, you asked Dr. Colman Henry, who's the Chief Clinical Officer of the HSC, how many cycles are utilised in the Irish testing of PCR. He said he could not answer, but would revert. Did he? And then, we we, we he? did, I think, get a, respond in the, a response in the end, uh, and I, I'm sorry, off the top of my head, I don't uh, recall it. Um, I mean, what I found most interesting was not maybe the number of... of he did say, though, that they... he stress that they carry out the number of cycles recommended by the test manufacturers um, and he that clarified what that was but I suppose what was interesting to me was the fact that the PCR will also capture people who've um, come into contact had it and are no longer infectious or come into contact with it in the past and um, are no longer infectious but equally I mean I accept that the Irish authorities are using PCR testing because the WHO say it's the best type of testing and other types of testing are, are, are less accurate. But, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it does have its limitations, sure. clearly, I think. Uh, that's from some, some old queen, SOQ, that's the name, that's the name he gives. Um, uh, and big fan of yours, actually, I must say. Uh, he... 
I, I, I can um, get, dig out the answer yeah. uh, and uh, supply it to Broadsheet. I'm, I'm fairly sure we, we got a reply. I mean, we were still actually getting replies after we um, finished the the report for, from the HSE. And that's not a, uh, I mean, I'd rather get replies late. I appreciate people are busy. They have lots of things to do. I, I don't mean, you know, but the fact that we were, we're still, there are a lot of replies there that I, uh, sure. well, I tried to dig that one out for you and send it to you so that you can share it. This is, a, I, I think, a very important question and something that never, well, well, very rarely gets raised. Uh, allowing public worship, uh, this is from Tom. Uh, hi, Michael. Allowing public worship seems to be low down on the list of priorities for government and net and for, uh, Currently, Ireland is the only country in Europe where public worship isn't taking place. I'm not sure if that's correct. But to Roland Lynn has used the term unimportant as regards religion. I'm not sure if that's correct either. While cabinet is very well stacked with committed religious believers. Do you think there's an implicit bias against the importance of religion and work with this, in the positions of government and input? Look, I mean, I, I, the government have basically, um, in these latest lockdown restrictions announced this morning, I mean, I read them and I was surprised to see that um, you are required to stay in your home unless you have a reasonable excuse for leaving. And among that is for if you're a, a priest or a minister, um, uh, and they say somebody who, who occupies a similar position in another religion, which, uh, you, you know, I don't know how you, you, you compare what people do in religions. But anyway, um, uh, that it's for the purpose of online worship. Now, by extension, that means that opening a, a church and saying mass becomes a penal offence. And I raised that with Stephen Donnelly in the Dáil and he said it was uh, I was incorrect, but I'm fairly certain I am correct. I mean, it is an offence to leave your house unless you have a reason and uh, a reasonable excuse is defined as uh, online services. Uh, our constitution specifically allows um, uh, freedom of worship to be limited on two bases. One, um, uh, public order, and the other is um, uh, public morality. Um, now, public order could be interpreted widely to include uh, public health, but I mean, in the, under the European Convention, it's, it can be limited on the basis of public health, public order, and public morality. Now, if the European Convention says public health and public order are two different things, well, then they are two different things. So, I mean, I don't think that in accordance with our constitution that there is the power to, to limit freedom of worship on the basis of public health. Now, it might be wise to do so, but that's not a decision for the government to make. It's for religions themselves to make. And I note that a lot of churches have closed their doors. But um, now, I put this to uh, um, uh, Professor Kenny of uh, Trinity College, <clears throat> and he, he thinks that public order is wide enough. Um, I, I beg to differ that. He's a professor of law. I'm a humble practitioner of law. Um, but certainly, I think there's a lack of awareness one way or the other about how important. I mean, to, to say, like, let's be honest, the majority of people who are in churches now are elderly. Uh, and many of them have chosen, uh, some of them have chosen not to go to church anymore. That's their absolute right. But some of them have wanted to go to church and some priests wanted to uh, keep churches open. Some didn't. Um, I, I would be in favor of respecting that autonomy. I mean, churches by their nature are not cramped spaces. And I think it displays an, a, an appalling um, sort of lack of respect for religion and in particular the separation of church and state yeah. and that you know people uh, religion is hugely important to people who, who, who are believers in it it's perhaps far more important than, than their allegiance to the state or their nationality or anything like that and that's not just true of the uh, of the Catholic Church which is the, the, the religion of the majority in Ireland traditionally it's just also true of every other religion and I just think it um uh, it's something that I, <clears throat> I don't agree with. I would very much agree that there's a, a lack of awareness of how important religion is in people's lives for those who are religious. Where are the rebellious priests and rectors who, are, who would defy? Who would, where, are the, where are the disobedient you know, priests who would open the church? Where, you know, really where is, there, I, uh, no, where there, are there, there, Well, there were priests who, who decided that, look, I'm going to open my church. Um, uh, I, I'm aware of that. Obviously, I'm not going to name them because they might be in difficulty not just with civil authorities but okay. also with okay. uh, with their own hierarchies. Okay. But there were priests who 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 um, um, I, I'm aware of in in uh, across the country. Yeah. Okay, underground church. But equally, I'm aware that the guidance of the Catholic Church was to close churches. But the Catholic Church is not the only religion in Ireland, um, and I don't really know what the other what views the other religions took. 
Yeah, well, certainly um, Archbishop <coughs> Martin is very uh, uh, pro the restrictions and, you know, encouraging more. I mean, this was a, yeah. And, and, yeah, well, and, that's, and has described. I mean, just as a, sorry, just as I, yeah, I mean, I respect, you know, separation of church and state. I mean, whatever his views are, he's entitled to hold them and, uh, uh, and uh, I suppose um, determine what his diocese at least does. I mean, I think that's how, yeah, I mean, he, you know, a church is a, is a diocese for ecclesiastical purposes. I'm very yeah, sure. he's very, he had very strong language for people who were questioning what was going on. Um, Again, that's a matter for, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, the, 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 this is about the costs, the, the, the debt and all that, so we maybe, maybe we won't get onto that because I just want to, um, well, the debt is actually a huge aspect of this. I mean, our, um, I mean, our, you know, there was an interesting um, graph in the Financial Times uh, during the week, um, which you know, our debt, uh, our deficit looked at about six percent of GDP, but of course, our GDP figure is entirely um, an, inac an entirely inaccurate measure of the Irish economy because of um, you know how reliant we are on foreign direct investment and uh, uh, corporation tax features, etc. But when you actually look at our GNI, uh, we had 11.5% uh, of that. It was the deficit that we're running. And I mean, that is something that, as I say, closing that deficit, paying back. The, I mean, we had a, a booming economy in 2018 and 19 with full employment, and yet we were barely able to run a surplus because of the 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 drag that the existing debt we had was creating on our economy. So by just massively increasing that debt, we are going to um, uh, uh, find ourselves, I think, in a very difficult situation. And of course, it is ultimately our economy, or it's not ultimately, it's just fully our tax take, our economy, that pays for services, including health, and we desperately need a better health care system. Yeah. Um, that's the reason we're here, and increased capacity in our health care system. Yeah, and yet we're spending 21 billion a year on the health system. It's just so, it's so, it's, it's really, we don't get value for money at all, do we? Any sense? You know? Well, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I think our spending looks low by international standards in health, but if you look, if you include our, uh, like um, insurance spending, it's, it's, it's actually higher. I mean, I think it's a lack of, uh, maybe not very good management. Uh, this two-tier health system, private and public, doesn't seem to have worked or be working. I mean, but I don't know that any country. I mean, ours, I think, is. I, I, I'd imagine if you went around and asked everybody in Europe, were they happy with their healthcare system? Um, uh, you know, I don't know would anybody be be happy. I mean, certainly Italy has. Uh, was Northern Italy in particular had an excellent healthcare system, and of course, that was completely overrun. But that's that's a a, a different issue. Yeah, well, um, and it was interesting even in northern Italy uh, to compare the, the regions. I mean, they have a, a devolved uh, government structure, including devolved uh, health, and they made different decisions on how to treat COVID at the very early stages in Lombardy and Veneto uh, in, uh, with very different uh, results in terms of deaths. I, I understand in Lombardy they took the approach of bringing everybody to hospital. People came to hospital, then they spread it, and then they left the hospitals and brought it back out again, whereas in Veneto they took the approach, look, keep everybody at home. Home and we would bring the medics to you and they had a notwithstanding having a very similar population structures and initial exposure to, to COVID they had a very very much lower um, uh, death rate resulting from it. You know you, you didn't sort of really address this in, in the report but why do we oh sorry you, uh, sorry no no I, I, sorry go ahead sorry okay um, uh, why for instance would did, did we have the exact same policy as say New York in regards to nursing homes I'm not entirely sure what you mean by that, sorry. Well, why did we do exactly the same thing as they did in terms of putting sick people into nursing homes, people that were symptomatic? I mean, oh, you mean letting people out of the, sending people out of the hospitals and into, um, and into nursing homes? Well, yeah. that's a question that the committee have recommended be looked at as part of a statutory inquiry. Um, you know, what role did the decision to um, discharge so many elderly people from acute hospitals into nursing homes, uh, what role did that play in the large number of deaths that occurred in nursing homes? Uh, the HSE during the committee were very keen to stress that it didn't play any role and that the transmission arrived otherwise. Uh, but it is certainly something that needs to be looked at. This was also our huge reliance on nursing homes to look after our elderly in Ireland. I mean, we do need to, to, to move away from nursing homes towards trying okay. to support people in their communities. How would, how would you explain a, a situation 
like that. I mean, why would New York, why would we do something exactly like New York? It was a shambolic decision, you know, terrible, terrible decision, but it seems to be made. I mean, what I'm suggesting is the decisions really aren't being made in, in Tubman at all. I think. I mean, these key decisions well, regarding what to do with nursing homes, what to do with, because otherwise... Well, I mean, I, I can I suppose, understand why the decision was made, um, because they there was panic that we were going to be overrun and we had to create capacity in the hospitals. But the issue is whether enough, sorry, whether enough, sure. given what they should have known at the time. I mean, we can't judge people uh, by what we now know. We can judge them by what should have been known then. So whether, given what... Sh- people knew or ought to have known then whether more safeguards could have been put in place. Also, of course, the private nursing homes um, imposed visitor restrictions on uh, the 6th of uh, March um, and uh, NEF had announced on the 10th of March that those restrictions, visitor restrictions were premature and unnecessary, so they were lifted. Uh, but then NEF had turned around two or three days later and, and, and said that, no, actually, those restrictions uh, should be reimposed. So, I mean, I don't know. Again, you know, we didn't ha- have the wherewithal to look into the impact that that decision, yeah. that, that recommendation would have had with regard to um, um, uh, the spread of COVID in nursing homes. Okay, okay. Well, if um, any. Yeah, okay. Uh, this is about Taiwan. It's sort of saying that, the, you know, the debts... Uh, Clampers outside writes, a young man struggles to meet the medical bills for his mother and turns to a life of ordinary... Oh, sorry, no. <laughs> That's the plot. <laughs> okay. um, this is a very, very long question, and we are running out a bit at a time. In the UK, the NHS is offering long COVID sufferers help at special centres so that people with persistent systems, s- symptoms can be assessed and get treatment, and the disease can be researched. Are any such clinics planned for Ireland? I don't know. I mean, uh, we asked uh, the, at the committee, um, uh, we, uh, the issue of long COVID was raised and Professor McConkie, I recall, saying that he, um, he hadn't seen enough evidence yet to determine whether long COVID was uh, something that was specifically different to um, post-viral um, uh, syndrome that the people have from other syndromes or whether the long COVID was something specific. Um, I, I, but that's not to say that it isn't. I'm just making the point that uh, I, I think, I suppose, you know, it's, it's a, it is a novel coronavirus. It's been with us for, for seven months. Um, there's a lot we know, but there's a novel that we don't know. Um, but I, I think we know enough to know that it'll be here for some time to come. Okay, um, uh, but I, I, to answer the question, I've no idea whether any such clinics are planned, or or even uh, I did ask Stephen Donnelly at the committee that was in August though, um, uh, if they had any statistics in the number of people who are suffering from um, so-called long COVID, or um, uh, you know, or having ongoing sequelae uh, after a period of time, uh, and he didn't have uh, statistics at that point. Now he may well have uh, statistics since then. I don't know. Okay, just um, in a sort of similar vein, um, uh, Mr. Mer- McNamara indicated on RT Ready One at the weekend that the collection of self harm and suicide figures has been suspended since March, April due to COVID. A number of people, doctors, medics on Twitter have since said that the assertion is not correct. Um, I did check up on that actually when this came in, and, and it does appear that they. Yeah. Sorry, go on, please. Yeah, they, um, well, they ceased, um, the, the National Self-Harm Registry, the staff of that weren't t- deemed to be essential workers uh, under the, 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 the lockdown legislation. So obviously they didn't work during that period in time. Now, um, some of the hospitals I understand are equipped to automatically send information to the National Self-Harm Registry. Others, uh, people have to go and collect that data. Some of the data is, is, is organised in, in a coding system, so you could probably get it very quickly, but some of it requires is going down through longhand and reading down through it. So uh, they fully recommenced um, uh, fully recommenced collecting the data at the end of August and have been collecting it since and they're also working backwards for the time period that they didn't have it. But the long and the short of it is that as we are asked as policy makers to roll over lockdowns and have another accept another lockdown or vote for another lockdown, we have no data at our disposal with regard to self-harm, 
during the period of the first lockdown. There is data, by the way, for the early months of it for um, uh, the first uh, period of lockdown, but not as it continued. And of course, we don't have suicide figures. Suicide figures are collected by the CSO. Likewise, they weren't essential workers, but I'm sure they'll be able to produce their figures in the normal course, the normal timing, which would be sometime in the middle of next year, we'll see suicide figures for this year. But given the... Um, uh, anecdotal evidence at least of an increase in, in, in um, mental health presentations I mean I think we should be able to try to get some data more quickly uh, you, so that we can actually analyse the effect Do you get that in your constituency uh, often? I mean do you get calls I mean is, it, is mental health a, a, a big I think it's a big I mean I've you know I'm aware of of, 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 of suicides um, in Sorry, yeah, I don't go into details. No, but I mean, uh, and I mean, you know, I, I am aware that I, I can see it in people's faces that people are uh, uh, anguished, increasingly anguished by lockdown. I mean, it's not surprising given, you know, that we are, we don't touch each other anymore and touch is a hugely important yeah. thing, even just to touch. A, like I remember when somebody explained to all, all the uh, old men who are drunks in villages, often who are single, and, and a lot of it is, is somebody once, uh, I'm not saying this is scientifically correct, or not, but it seemed plausible to me that it's the only opportunity they get to touch somebody because when you're drunk, you touch somebody, which is of course why, which is why Niffa don't want people uh, drinking. And I understand that because you're, you, you become less inhibited and you become more uh, tactile. Yeah. Um, um, but touch is important. We're social animals. Like all animals, touch is important to them. We're, we're the same. Michael, um I'm, I'm, we're, we're, we've ran out of time. We have ran out of questions, loads of questions. I'm going to send that bunch, actually, there's a few, four or five, that were really quite complex, and you could probably maybe answer it in your own time or whatever. You know, answer them and okay, look time. forward to that. You could do it as a post. But um, yeah. just on this, uh, on a more sort of existential, and you, you're the only kind of mainstream politician who has questioned... Uh, to even go so far as you've gone, I mean, have you, can I ask you two, quite, two, two Carter, one, um, why aren't there anybody, why isn't there anybody else uh, like you and at the, uh, at the moment, I'm sure there will be more, but, uh, and the second question was, uh, are you getting a lot of criticism from, from your colleagues, our constituents? Um, no, I mean, I, 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 I'm not getting criticism from my, my colleagues. I mean, some of them obviously disagree with me. And, uh, you know, a lot of people agree with the approach that's been taken. A lot of TDs agree with it. Um, um, and then there are, I think, some who more pri privately disagree with it or at least have reservations. Um, I suppose, I mean, I, I, I was a member of a political party. You have to adhere to a whip. I just think the, the way the whip system works in Ireland is detrimental to politics because, you know, you're whipped on every single vote. And I, I accept that there has to be some discipline in a party, but that doesn't mean that everybody has to agree on everything. Um, uh, um, so I suppose people are afraid maybe if they speak out that suddenly they'll... Um, they'll still have to vote in a particular way and they'll be accused of hypocrisy. But I wouldn't say I'm the only TD. I mean, Michael McDool is a, he's fairly mainstream. I mean, I wouldn't share I mean, necessarily he, all of his... He's in the upper house, uh, Michael. He's in the, he's in the Senate. Yeah. Uh, Matty McGrath has... Um, has, has um, uh, look, we, we'll have a better indication by this evening because we'll be voting on um, rolling over the, the, the power to make restrictions for a further um, set until next June or if the Sinn Féin is, uh, amendment is accepted uh, until February. So I suppose we'll see then, we'll have a better indication of where people stand on that. I mean, whether they think there's a necessity to be able to make restrictions, uh, to impose the type of restrictions that have been imposed or whether they don't. Okay, um, Michael, we have so many quite more questions. We've, we've no more time. We've a whole load of questions about your hair. Uh, <laughs> All right, um, well, I'm afraid it's not, uh, it's not, this, it doesn't, uh, it's not something I spend a lot of time uh, uh, no. looking after or anything like that. Jealous. I thought we'd have a hair off, but you want, you win oh, the day. You know. Some other time, some other time. Some other time. Michael, thank right. you so much for joining us. It's a great pleasure. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for that.